to Bishop and that's 40 miles from Bishop to Benton, which is the official end. are the Alabama Hills, so a whole bunch of movies have been filmed back in here. that turn. Yike. Okay, I gotta pay attention. Yeah, so we are approaching the Manzanar internment camp. So if you have not heard of this, in World War II, the United States, after the onset of World War II, they forcefully relocated 
over a hundred thousand first and second generation Japanese Americans. So these were American citizens. These were not Japanese who were living in the United States or anything like that. They deported those. But these were U.S. citizens with Japanese heritage. And it was only done on the West Coast. It was done by executive order. And there was literally a line they drew. I think it was within 100 miles of the coast or something fairly close to that. And it was because of the perceived risk of spying. They didn't do anything similar to German or Italian U.S. citizens. And so when it really came down to it, it was just racism. That's all it was. It was, it was racism. But it resulted in over 100,000 U.S. citizens being detained and forcefully moved out here to camps like this. The level of unjustness that occurred as a result of that is hard to express, truly. The number of people arrested by the FBI and other organizations for espionage in the United States during World War II was like less than two dozen, and none of them were among the first and second generation U.S. citizen groups. They were all you know, Japanese who had come over to spy. And if you look at the history of it, you have, I can't remember if it's the 99th. So they actually formed several infantry battalions from Japanese. They served in Italy and Germany and the European theaters. And they are, they remain believe the most highly decorated battalion in U.S. military history. Their families, their children are all locked up back in the United States and they're over in Europe fighting for that country. That's a level of patriotism that's really hard to describe. They were heroes fighting while their families and friends were locked up by their own country because they didn't think they could trust them. Oh, here's the memorial up here. Okay, so I'll pull over by it. But yeah, this is Manzanar. I'm guessing graves. May 16th, 1942. I'm going to butcher that name, so I'm not even going to try, but became the first of 150 men, women, and children to die in camp. He and 14 others were laid to rest in the cemetery in what used to be a peach orchard. 120,313 Japanese Americans were confined by the United States during the war. And we're gonna keep moving. 76 miles to Bishop, like I said, 40 more miles after that to the end. Mess Hall, so yeah, here you can see some of the, at least concrete pads and stuff for some of the buildings.
don't know if this doesn't look like it, but this is soft as hell. So I'm just trying to stay on top of it and not get a major wobble going. soft or not really? No, it's not. Okay. That's pretty soft though. See that better or worse, but it's blinding. Can't see if there's bumps, can't see if there's sand. It's just white. sand. Oh god, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's basically a salt flat. patch there about wipe my front wheel out. God, that would have just pitched me straight into the scrub brush. <laughs> Surprise!
actually much of a climb. Because, yeah, it was described as a technical climb for about three miles. And it's not climbing much. It's just rocky. are embedded, especially the big ones. Rock rolled over under my front wheel. It happens. Every once in a while you just will get something unlucky. I could have made that, I just, I ended up on a crappy line, it happens while everything is booting up. Let's talk about falling, it's not a big deal, you know, as long as you're not breaking things or hurting yourself, you're gonna fall over, like these are not easy routes. You shouldn't be having big ones all the time, tip overs and stuff, especially in pretty technical terrain like that, yeah, they're gonna happen. A lot of new riders, especially new to off-road riders, get super embarrassed or stressed out when they fall over. And I get it, like, yeah, it's frustrating to fall over. You gotta pick the bike up again, and, and you never see the pros fall. You know, that's one of the reasons why I do show my falls. You know, a lot of times you'll never see the pro riders struggle or fall over or whatever. And that's fine, you know. Most of the time when they're doing stuff, they're doing it to demonstrate the abilities of a bike or themselves or both. Get through this. Okay. But yeah, you just see pros flying through stuff at warp nine like it's no big deal. And so you think you should be able to do that too. Well, there's a few things going on. They have multiple takes. If they get it wrong, they can reset and do it again. You know, if I wanted to make myself look like the biggest Billy Badass on an adventure bike, I could do it. I'm doing my editing. I don't have to show you me struggling. I choose to 
because it's more honest and it's part of the experience of adventure riding. I am not a professional rider. Hell, I make no claims of really even being an expert rider. Yeah, don't get upset about falling. Pros do it too. It just doesn't normally get shown to the public because it doesn't further the narrative of the perfect rider. You're gonna fall over on this stuff. <laughs> you, you just are. Even the uh, filming expeditions, I do wish they would be a little bit more clear sometimes on the difficulty of getting through certain areas. They used to be worse about it. Um, like some of the early filming expeditions, you would watch it and you wouldn't really know if anybody had fallen over. Even on the difficult stuff. And now they're a lot more transparent about it. You know, the they show you when stuff is difficult. They show you when people are struggling and falling over like it happens. And it helps you judge the difficulty of the route. There we go. So, I'm glad that they started doing that more. It's also something I try and be very clear about in my videos. is it seems like a bunch of these little rocky bits are right around corners <laughs> which means you really can't get any speed up or analyze your lines you just have to go with it wherever you're at that's pretty much what you're doing Oops, that was neutral let's not do that Right wherever I can. Here it is. up here but maybe not there's no waypoint for anything so don't know yeah that was funny most of that road was totally fine and really enjoyable and then you just hit these boulder gardens. <laughs> Okay. I guess the uh, 
Storms had something to say about that. Doesn't help that it's right in the middle of a curve. I'm not sure which one of those I followed. Straight. I don't even think that's a road. Valley Radio Observatory. telescopes are able to operate during the day is because they're picking up radio frequencies not light it's not a visible light telescope and so it's able to operate during the day the frequencies that astronomers use are dependent on kind of what they're researching and trying to observe so basically a lot of the stuff that they're looking for and looking at the light is no longer in the visible light spectrum. It's been shifted to other frequencies from various phenomena. And so, you know, they can be looking at stuff down to x-rays and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, radio telescopes are neat. Ironically, it was actually radio telescopes like that which were used to receive and retransmit the original moon landings because the transmitters that they had on the spacecraft weren't very powerful. And so they used, there's a really big telescope down in Australia that they used for a lot, like the original Apollo 11 footage. That's where that was transmitted and retransmitted from. Because it's like a 60 meter dish. Something like that. It's huge. And so it was able to pick up the Apollo transmissions. And, and for the TV broadcast and everything, you could retransmit.
hell yes. So many Titus Canyons since I couldn't do the actual one. Is it just you? I guess so. God only knows where you ran to. First gear and just nice and easy. God, it started with snow and ended with snow. I've been dodging snow all friggin' year. Well, I guess that's appropriate to be dodging snow basically the entire time and to finish with snow. <laughs> off-road that I will do on a VDR as part of this trip. God, that's been incredible. California is a bear, man. Like, <laughs> it is an advanced only route for sure. You should not be coming up here if you are not a pretty skilled rider and preferably bring people with you if you can. I would not do this route alone again. That is 11, baby. That is all 11. Woo! <laughs> that might have blanked out my microphone. <laughs> but that is all of them. Yes! 21 
1,000 miles, 11 BDRs, roughly 11,000 miles of that has been off-road. Future Brady coming to you from the editing suite. First, I just wanted to thank everyone for their support in this crazy adventure. My subscribers, my friends, both new and old, riding buddies, both new and old, and everyone else that I've run into along the way, I have loved sharing my adventures and experiencing this journey together. Going forward, I'm gonna be taking a bit of a break, just to reset, take a breather, plan my next steps. Videos will still post on YouTube here and there, but I can't guarantee any kind of schedule right now. Patreon supporters will still see stuff in advance, and we'll get more behind the scenes stuff of my planning and additional projects before the rest of the world sees them. If you continue to like what I'm doing, like the video, subscribe to the channel, tell your friends, and consider supporting me on Patreon if you'd really like to see me keep doing what I've been doing. Lots of plans and projects on the horizon, and I look forward to sharing it all with you.